So chemical pollution can be invisible and the chemicals themselves can be in very low concentrations. However, they can still cause a number of harmful negative effects. PFAS are a group of substances that we've used for a really long time. Um, since the 1940s, and some can cause health problems. Chemicals can sometimes end up polluting our environment and our waterways as a result. Hi, and welcome to today's video talking about water and water quality in honor of World Water Day. I'm Stephanie Metzger. I'm a policy advisor at the Royal Society of Chemistry, and I'm here today with my colleague Natalie Sims, also a policy advisor to discuss this really important topic. Natalie, do you want to give us a bit of an introduction about water and water quality and some issues in general with water pollution that we might want to consider on this World Water Day? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think there's no doubt that we're facing serious issues and challenges of chemical pollution in our waterways. I think so we use and rely on a huge number of chemicals in our everyday lives, for example, from medicines, uh, consumer products, we use them in agriculture and transport. However, chemicals can sometimes end up polluting our environment and our waterways as a result. And a recent report from the Rivers Trust, um, looking at the state of our rivers in 2024, highlighted that not a single river in England was in good chemical health. So chemical pollution can be invisible and the chemicals themselves can be in very low concentrations. However, they can still cause a number of harmful and negative effects to wildlife, to the wider environment and also to humans. So chemicals can get in our waterways via a number of different ways. Um, so most is from human activities. So one example is agricultural runoff. So for example, when we apply things like fertilizers or pesticides um, to our fields, when it rains, these can then run off into our waterways. Um, also runoff from urban areas such as cities and roads are an issue. And another really major source is from effluent or treated wastewater um, from our wastewater treatment plants. So our conventional wastewater treatment plants um, were never really made to remove chemicals, things like pharmaceuticals or microplastics. So these can still be present in sort of the final treated effluent. And once these chemicals are in the water environment, um, like our rivers and our coasts, it can be really hard to remediate or clean them up. And as a result, they can end up in our drinking water sources, which I guess, Steph, you might talk about um, in a minute. Yeah. And, and they can also end up, for example, in our coastal water bodies and oceans. And I think maybe traditionally um, it was thought that our oceans could just sort of dilute all of our waste and they wouldn't um, be an issue. But I think this is clearly not the case. And I think we are seeing issues with persistent chemicals, for example, seeing bioaccumulation or build up in sort of marine wildlife mammals, such as whales and dolphins. And there are concerns that these are having sort of negative effects on them, for example, like their fertility. So, yeah, I think it's um, obviously really important that we're talking about water quality today on World Water Day. Yeah, definitely. I think, I mean, that's a great overview. And I think some of the things you just said really resonated with me. For example, the fact that some of these chemicals are really persistent, which means they stick around for a long time. They have a hard time degrading in the environment. Um, and often that means that they get stuck in our bodies or the bodies of, um, of animals um, or in the soil. And so that means that they're sticking around and they are able to affect us over time. Um, and one example of this uh, is a is a substance, a group of substances called PFAS, which stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And um, PFAS are something that we've been working on at the RSC for for a few years now, um, as it's become sort of a, a hot topic in the media and something that is being worked on at the national and international level um, in in science and also in in political bodies, um, because PFAS are a group of substances that we've used for a really long time, um, since the 1940s, and they are built on the carbon-fluorine bond, which is one of the strongest bonds in nature. So they're really durable, which means they provide some different uh, types of um, properties like heat resistance, water resistance, oil resistance, and more. And so they've been really useful for things like making, for example, nonstick pans that we use to cook with and are a lot easier to clean. But the durability of these materials also means that they're quite persistent in the environment. And they also often can bioaccumulate in our bodies and some can cause health problems. And we've learned this uh, more in, in recent years that actually some of these products that we were using may have been 
toxic to us and to wildlife and, and bad for the environment. And so we have been looking at this topic um, because we want to make sure that the government is taking action to stop exposure to these negative types of PFAS um, where at all possible. And one area is in drinking water. And as Natalie mentioned, often these chemicals, they get into water bodies through maybe, you know, industrial effluents or out of a wastewater treatment plant or through just like use of products in our life or maybe through um, landfills leaking into the groundwater. And then if water is taken from one of these contaminated places and used for drinking water, there's a risk that we could be exposed. And our wastewater or our drinking water treatment um, in the UK anyway is quite sophisticated and it does filter out a lot of, of um, substances, including some PFAS, but we are still seeing that PFAS is present in some drinking water at levels that recent science has shown might be harmful to us if we ingest it over time at this level, uh, at these concentrations. And so we're looking to, to again, make stricter rules on how much of this chemical can be present in our drinking water and thinking more broadly about how we can stop it from getting into the environment in the first place. Um, but this is just, you know, one example of how not thinking about the chemicals we use and, and how they get into the environment can ultimately end up harming ourselves or, again, the environment and wildlife um, if we're not careful about how we use and control these substances. So I think this discussion of PFAS and many of these other chemical contaminants in that exist in our water now um, really highlights the issue of the need to design materials in a way that is sustainable and that's thinking not only about how the material functions and how it might be used, but what happens in its end of life as well. Because historically in our sort of linear economy, we make something, we use it, and then we throw it away and we don't really think about what happens afterwards. But we need to transition towards more of a circular economy where we're thinking about designing products for not only its use, but also its end of life, how it will be disposed of, recycled, recovered, reused, or whatever, whatever way we can manage to do that. And for a lot of these chemicals, they're sort of designed to be one use. Um, and we need to think about a better way to develop new materials. And chemistry is going to be so important for figuring out the answers to these questions. The chemical sciences are going to be the people, chemical scientists are going to be the ones innovating these new materials that, for example, maybe instead of sticking around in the environment forever, are able to biodegrade or maybe are able to be recovered and reused, whether that's recovered out of wastewater or recovered at the end of their life and recycled. Um, and so there's a lot of new innovative materials being made and also innovations in the processes that we use to make and recover materials to try to move towards this more, more circular economy. And for something like PFAS, that's really important because we, we do like the properties that PFAS give us. Things like heat resistance and water resistance are things that we need in our products in our everyday life. So we have a really tough question here where we want to have products that are safe for people to have sustained use and that aren't going to contaminate the environment at the end of their life, but they also still have to be technically very good in order to provide these benefits, especially in, in uses like in batteries, for example, where we need our batteries to be heat proof so they don't spark or cause problems in our you know, electric vehicles or, or other applications in the transition to, to net zero um, or in our you know, waterproof clothing, for example, where if you are going to do research in the Antarctic and you need your clothing to be waterproof in order to keep yourself warm and dry, you can't compromise on the effectiveness of the material. So it's really important for us to be thinking about designing new materials that are effective from a, a technical perspective, but also the way that their chemical structure is doesn't cause these issues with you know, toxicity to humans or the environment. So in regards to the UK before Brexit, um, used to be covered under EU regulatory frameworks for managing water. However, the UK is going through a post-Brexit transition period with regards to their water policy. 
So furthermore, it gets a bit more complex as well because water policy within the UK is devolved. So this means that each of the devolved nations can make their own decisions to how water is managed. And there are potential changes occurring at the EU level with regards to water management, particularly in the way in changes into how wastewater is being treated and also what is being monitored. So, for example, in the Water Framework Directive, there's a proposal at the EU level to expand out the scope of what's being monitored in surface waters and groundwaters, and that's to include more micropollutants. So included in that proposed list is actually certain PFAS. So due to these potential changes, it is highly likely that the UK will be diverging from EU with regards to its water management and monitoring requirements. And furthermore, because water policy in the UK is devolved, there is likely to be potential divergence within the UK itself with regards to this monitoring of water quality too. So for example, the UK government has already expressed it's going to diverge from EU standards of monitoring water in England. So if each of the devolved nations sort of choose their own path for their monitoring, we do risk divergence within the UK itself. So I guess why is that an issue? So why is having a lack of harmonised monitoring data within the UK a problem? Well, monitoring data is key for establishing baselines for chemical pollutants and for identifying sort of problem areas or potential hotspot areas um, for different chemicals. It's also really important for evaluating interventions that are being implemented to try and improve water quality. So without having harmonised data, we risk sort of our long term monitoring data for chemicals and also risk having water quality data that's not comparable with the EU, but also not within the UK itself. And as a lot of micropollutants and sort of these chemicals that we're talking about are very mobile in the environment, they're not going to be sort of confined by geographic boundaries. They're going to be moving around. It's interesting you mentioned diverging data and standards because this is another issue we're seeing for PFAS. And certainly PFAS is not the only group of chemicals where these issues apply, but it's just a group where we're seeing a lot of these issues come to the fore and it really illustrates what you're talking about. So for example, in England and Wales, the Environment Agency has quite a robust monitoring program for PFAS, and the Drinking Water Inspectorate actually requires water companies to test for 47 different types of PFAS at an individual limit of 100 nanograms per liter as a, as a maximum amount allowed in drinking water. Whereas in Scotland, there's less of an environmental monitoring program, and they also don't have limits for specific PFAS in their drinking water policy, but they do actually follow the EU's regulations, which are new since, since we've left the EU, um, where they have a combined total limit for 20 PFAS of 100 nanograms per liter for the total concentration of all of those, all those 20. And um, so it just shows that already there's some choices being made in England and Wales versus in Scotland of whether to align with the EU or whether to make our own separate policy. And in this case, this is actually something where we think the best policy would actually be a bit of both of these approaches. So the RSC has suggested that we think the best way to have safe drinking water um, limits for PFAS is actually to have both an individual standard per PFAS at 10 nanograms per liter, which is lower than the current England and Wales um, level but we are suggesting an individual limit like is done here. And also adding a combined total to make sure that the overall burden of PFAS in our drinking water is not too high, like the Scottish level. So actually a combined approach is quite good, but we can see right now that both have taken, you know, both countries, um, both nations have taken one of these approaches, but not both. So clearly we think that there's a little bit more to be done with this PFAS in drinking water question, which is why that we have suggested that people write to their local MPs to make sure that the government knows that this is an issue, a priority issue that we think change needs to happen on immediately. Um, and so we have actually set up a system where people can write to their MPs with um, some information on PFAS, and also with our policy asks, which again include strengthening strengthening the limits um, for the amount of PFAS allowed in our drinking water, as well as broadening the monitoring program for PFAS in the environment and making stricter limits for the amount of PFAS allowed in effluents from industrial sites or anywhere else where they may be showing to, to enter the environment in the first place. Because like we said earlier, it's one thing to have to clean these things up you know, when they're in the environment already, but it's better to prevent them from entering the environment in the first place. 
And so that's one campaign we've been doing at the RSC about water quality. And again, trying to get some actions, some very concrete actions that the government can take now to immediately improve people's health and also to hopefully prevent this problem from getting bigger in the future and causing more of a spiral of having to you know, clean things up and, and deal with things once they've gotten even more out of control. The chemical sciences are key for addressing a lot of the challenges that we've talked about in the water and chemicals sort of regulatory space. Um, for example, in highlighting the issues through analysis and monitoring, um, through wastewater treatment processes, and also sort of the development for alternatives um, for use of, to replace toxic chemicals. Um, so I guess as part of the wider policy team, the next year we're going to be continuing to bring together our members and our wider experts to identify sort of policy options and where the chemical sciences can contribute and influence decision making in both the water environment and in the chemicals um, space too. And I think this is particularly important in a time where the UK is going through this transition period um, with regards to these different policy areas. And of course, the RSC is more than just the policy team. We have people across the organization working on various issues around water and water quality, as well as broader environmental and sustainability work. Um, for example, our publishing team has a lot of great work going on in this space. And you can check some of that out by going to this QR code, which will bring you to our environmental science, water research and technology publishing page, where you can look at some of our themed collections around water. And we expect more uh, in this area to be coming out soon, including a few new books as well, for example, on PFAS alternatives. So thanks for listening in today on our talk on water quality and watch the space for more water work coming out in this area. And in addition to watching the video today, we're asking those of you in the audience in the chemical sciences to reach out and to join in to our work at the RSC, becoming a member or getting involved in our policy work through some of our policy volunteer groups, staying in touch with our communications through social media, getting involved in our publishing, and many other opportunities that we have. Um, we're always excited for people to reach out, tell us about your work, and help us to move the field forward in this really crucial, important area of water.